Welcome back everyone to another Fat Ninja Studios review episode. This time we're talking about Marvel's new series, Loki, which debuted its first episode on Disney Plus on June 9th. Due to copyright issues, we won't be live streaming and reviewing the episodes as we did with the previous two series. So instead, we'll be doing a weekly review video where we'll give you a detailed breakdown of the episode as well as our predictions for future storylines. Spoiler warning ahead for episodes 1 and 2 of Loki. Also, before we get started, please consider hitting that subscribe button and giving the video a like. It helps us out tremendously. Alright, here we go. The episode starts off where Endgame ended, with Loki snatching up the Tesseract and being transported through space and ending up in Mongolia, where he's promptly arrested by the TVA. The TVA stands for the Time Variance Authority, soldiers and analysts who serve powerful beings known as the Timekeepers. They keep the time stream from having any deviations. Whenever a person affects the timeline in a way that they weren't supposed to, they are called a variant and then they're caught, judged, and sentenced by the TVA court system. Usually a sentence ends in the variant and aforementioned time being reset. The way the TVA does this is by using a time twister on a variant and also reset grenade, which helps wipe out all traces of that branch timeline. Anywho, upon arriving at the TVA, Loki of course tries to escape, but He's kept in check by Hunter B-15, played wonderfully by Wunmi Mosaku, using a time caller which is controlled by a remote that can instantly reverse time or fast forward it in some cases for the person wearing said time caller. The cosmic cube is handed over to a clerk named Casey before Loki is put through a series of checkpoints. One notable moment is the time aura scan in which a man asks him if he knows if he's a robot or not? Please confirm to your knowledge that you are not a fully robotic being. We're born an organic creature and do in fact possess what many cultures would call a soul. What? To my knowledge? Do a lot of people not know if they're robots? This is a reference to the Doombots in Marvel Comics, clones of Doctor Doom whom truly think they are alive but turn out to be intricate cyborgs. We see scorch marks on the sides of the detector, which means that a few have gone through and been melted from the inside out. Meanwhile, Mobius M. Mobius, played to fantastical delight by the always charming Owen Wilson, is investigating the murder of Three Minutemen, TVA's version of a SWAT team in 1500 France. There, he encounters a child with a curiosity he shouldn't have. Kablooey Blueberry Gum, first sold in the 2040s. He's interrupted by a clerk who hands him a file of the recent custody of Loki. Then he takes the gum into evidence and goes forward with erasing the deviant timeline using one of the charges. Back in the TVA, Loki is waiting for his turn to see the judge when he's given a quick rundown of their history. Welcome to the Time Variance Authority. I'm Miss Minutes, and it's my job to catch you up before you stand trial for your crimes. At the beginning of time, there was a multiversal war, and afterwards, three timekeepers rose up and created the sacred timeline, essentially. We have a theory on that, so hear us out. That multiversal war they reference, that was the Celestials versus the Beyonders. The Beyonders, most likely in one of their experiments, were collapsing the multiverse in on itself, and the Celestials wielding the power of the Infinity Stones and whatever other cosmic artifacts they had tried to hold them off. Three of the Beyonders, however, decided it wasn't right to wipe out all this life, and sided with the Celestials. And such created the Time Stream, a singular flow of events in which the Beyonders could either not cross into, or would lose interest in. This will most likely be explored heavily in the Eternals movie, and just a quick tease to whet our appetites. Moving on. 
Loki gets his chance to be judged and is sentenced by Ravana Renslayer. How do you plead? Smugly played by Gugu Mbatha Ra to be reset. But just before B-15 can carry out this sentence, Mobius steps in and asks if he can borrow Loki for his current mission. If you're thinking what I think you're thinking, it's a bad idea. Okay, I'm just chasing a hunch. Renslayer begrudgingly acquiesces, and Mobius takes Loki into his own custody. At this point, the God of Mischief is bewildered at not being able to use his magic, but complies semi-quietly. During their walk, Loki comments on how this situation is a nightmare, and Mobius tells him, That's another department. Now that department I'll help you burn down. <laughs> which implies that the Nightmare Dimension does exist. When they arrive at Mobius's office, Loki tries to charge him, but is again thwarted by the time caller that's still wrapped around his neck. Mobius begins to interview him and, through a series of questions, begins to strip away Loki's facade. Showing Loki details of his life, both from what he's known up until his escape in 2012, where the timeline deviated, and the original timeline playing out that we all saw in the MCU films, including the death of his mother and so forth. Mobius tells Loki straightforward, he was never going to accomplish his goals of being a ruler. He was always meant to be a stepping stone, an obstacle for heroes to defeat and become even better people. You're lying. It's not true. It is true. That's the proper flow of time, and it happens again and again and again because it's supposed to, because it has to. Again, Mobius is interrupted, leaving Loki behind in his office. A quick moment before being interrupted, you can see Loki stuffing something into his pocket. Of course, he managed to snag the remote for the time caller, and uses it to escape the room by returning himself to an earlier moment when he was in a hallway. He tracks down the clerk from earlier, who collected the tesseract from him, and threatens him in order to get it back. Casey complies, showing him a drawer full of artifacts, most notably, a pile of infinity stones. Loki is flabbergasted by this. And Casey goes on to explain that they are just rocks to the people here, nothing more than paperweights. This finally dawns on Loki how powerful the TVA is. Side note, the TVA exists outside of time and space, called Null Space. Infinity Stones themselves can only be used in their proper universes, at least as far as the comics go. The MCU, however, is questionable, in that during Endgame, technically the Avengers stole them from an alternate reality, used them in the main continuity, and then returned them. It could be that because time and such doesn't exist in Null Space, that that is what causes the Infinity Stones to not hold power. Or they have some kind of barrier that prevents any cosmic or magical ability from being used. Anyway, B-15 barges in trying to recapture Loki, who once again uses the remote to send himself back into Mobius's office. Here he views the remaining major events from the rest of his timeline, including the death of Odin, and Odin calling him son, Ragnarok, healing the rift between himself and Thor, and finally his death at the hands of Thanos. During this moment, the words, you will never be a god, echo throughout. And while it was a proud last defiant moment in the original context, here it mimics what Mobius said to him earlier, that he was always destined to fail. This causes Loki to cry and then break into laughter, reciting his old catchphrase. Glorious purpose. B-15 once again storms in to put a hurting on the man of mischief, and he manages to get the time caller off of himself and onto her, having a bit of revenge on her for her treatment of him earlier. 
Not long after, Mobius enters and Loki takes a seat, telling him the truth about himself for once. He ends the conversation by calling himself a villain, to which Mobius replies he doesn't think that's quite true either. Mobius then offers him a chance at something new, to help catch a deadly variant who has been dispatching Minutemen all over the timeline. When Loki asks him why, Mobius replies with, The variant we're hunting is you. I beg your pardon? The final scene of the episode shows us a cloaked figure setting a trap in the middle of a field for the TVA. A futuristic sword, which we theorized could possibly be something like the Black Necro Sword, or alternatively, a cosmic key from the Masters of the Universe comics that Marvel also published back in the day. Sticks out of the ground, and there are pools of oil all throughout the tall grass. Just before the Minutemen can deploy a reset charge though, the cloaked figure drops a lantern and engulfs them all in flame. The figure then snatches up the time grenade and the credits roll. On to the second episode. It starts off in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, during a Ren Fair in 1985. The Minutemen portal in. As a woman who strikingly resembles a young Agatha Harkness begins to chide them for not having era-appropriate costumes on, but seemingly is unfazed by the fact that they just showed up out of thin air through a magical doorway. They've tracked another anomaly here and they try to investigate. But surprise, surprise, it's a trap set up by the evil Loki. Hunter C-20, played by Sasha Lane, has her mind taken over and dispatches the other Minutemen before being knocked out herself and dragged away along with another reset charge. Title credits roll and then we cut to Loki sitting at a desk being quizzed by Miss Minutes, who is not quite a recording but also not actually there. She asks him about what reset charges do, giving us a clue as to why the evil Loki is collecting them, which we already know is that they erase the deviant timeline completely. Mobius swings by to collect him. They just received another alert that a bunch of Minutemen didn't come back. While investigating the site of the attack, Loki begins to stall for time, saying that the evil Loki has set a trap, and if they leave, they'll all be killed. Curious if he was actually telling the truth, because a conversation later makes it seem that he was delaying them so they could be killed, but perhaps he delayed them enough that the evil Loki would just leave and try again some other time. Anywho. B-15 grows impatient and Mobius calls Loki out on his stalling tactics and they decide to reset the timeline and call the mission a failure. Back at the TVA, Mobius meets with Renslayer to discuss the recent mission where he admits that it's not working out the way he planned and he still has a hunch that having Loki with him will be useful. In the office also, there are three major statues of the Timekeepers. The one in the center particularly resembles King the Conqueror, which leads me into a theory that the reason the Timekeepers have not been seen by anyone in a while, and why the timeline isn't completed, is that possibly two of them see the sacred timeline in an orderly fashion, possibly influenced by the cosmic entity Master Order, while Kang, who enjoys ruling, sees the potential of multiple universes and needs these deviant timelines to exist, his influence stemming from Lord Chaos. Kang could see himself as more powerful than the others, including the Beyonders, whom we discussed in a theory at the beginning of this video, and has manipulated events himself to create this particular situation. Renslayer assures Mobius that the Timekeepers are heavily invested in this hunt for the evil Loki variant, and that he doesn't have much room for any mistakes. Mobius leaves, grabs Loki, and then takes him to the library to put him to work. 
Unable to access anything other than the file of his own life, Loki reads through some of the events, and one triggers something in him. During Ragnarok, over 9,000. Boom! It's over 9,000! What 9,000? There's no way that can be right! Asgardians die before Asgard is completely wiped out of existence. This sparks an idea in Loki, who rushes to find Mobius eating a salad. Using a clumsy metaphor, and destroying Mobius' salad, Loki explains that evil Loki can hide in timelines where catastrophic, world-ending events occur. Because, no matter what he does, it all gets wiped out in the end, leaving no trace. No evidence he was actually there and thus does not create a branching timeline. To test this theory, Mobius and Loki head to Pompeii, shortly before the eruption of Vesuvius, and create a bit of minor mischief. The volcano explodes, and then boom! No timeline deviation. This leads Mobius back to that random pack of Kablooey bubblegum, and how it didn't have any temporal trace on it. Loki and Mobius both research when the gum was created, and then continue on to look for a disastrous world events during those years. They finally settle on a massive hurricane that wipes out a small city, and the only place that sells that brand of gum in that city is Roxcart. Roxcart is most likely a division of Roxxon, famously known through Marvel Comics as an evil corporation. It even played a major role in the show Cloak and Dagger. Mobius goes to Renslayer to get approval for a task force, which she begrudgingly gives him, and they head to Alabama in 2049. Not long after they're there, V-15 and Loki come across a suspicious survivor, who suddenly shows the ability to possess bodies. The real force behind these possessions is, of course, evil Loki who has a little back and forth with our Loki about being puppets and the like. Our Loki states that he's actually infiltrated the TVA and is using his cover to get close to the timekeepers so that he can overthrow them and rule in their stead. This bemuses evil Loki, who has now hopped into a few other bodies, and then decides to attack our Loki, in the case he was actually a good guy just trying to play a trick. After a short battle, the real evil Loki reveals HERSELF, a female version with blonde hair. However, we theorize that this evil Loki's form isn't their true form either, just another illusion to kind of play on Loki's sympathetic side. We actually think that evil Loki is just our Loki from the future, and knows how to play himself in order to get his own cooperation and has just taken over a random body. Our evidence. Towards the beginning of the episode, a small discussion erupts between Mobius and Loki about shapeshifting and how an illusion is just like an image. Like kinda what Goku does to Krillin in the first world tournament in DBZ. And then there's the duplication casting which creates a copy down to a molecular structure of something or someone. In fact, here's the clip. And no two are alike. Slight differences in appearances, or not so slight, different powers, although powers generally include shape-shifting, illusion, projection, and my Duplication favorite... Duplication Illusion projection. They're the two completely different powers, actually. How? Illusion projection involves depicting a detailed image from outside oneself, which is perceptible in the external world, whereas duplication casting entails recreating an exact facsimile of one's own body in its present circumstance, which acts as a true holographic mirror of its molecular structure. But, uh, you already knew that. Our second piece of evidence, it's only episode two! Nowhere are they gonna reveal the entire villain this early, especially not with someone as complex and given to trickery as Loki is concerned. Sure, he or she could be working for another entity entirely, 
but we think this isn't evil Loki's final form. The third piece of evidence. Please. If anyone's anyone, you're me. To us, that says, I'm your future. You're my past. It could also just be a play on the old trope of, you and I aren't that different. But that would be kind of a letdown. Then again, expect the expected, right? From this point, Evil Loki uses one of the Minutemen's wrist computers to open several portals to different timelines and begins deploying the reset charges to said timelines. Back at the TVA, alarms are blaring off the wall as multiple branches are swiftly creating many alternate realities, and with so many Minutemen having been killed and a majority of the Force here to capture evil Loki, there's not enough to stop all the incursions. Evil Loki then disappears through a portal, not giving our Loki any answers, and before Mobius can actually catch up to him, our Loki steps through the portal and the episode ends. If we had to guess from the events we saw earlier in the trailer, most likely we will see the two Lokis hop between the branches as they would be hidden in the chaos, and we will either get more backstory as to why evil Loki is doing all of this, or reveal another force behind it. Mobius will most likely either be chewed out by Renslayer, or be stuck in the 2049 timeline. But we also believe the theory that the multiple timelines would lead to collapse will actually have the opposite effect, and we will now see the birth of the multiverse. We also predict that before the series ends, at some point Mobius will be in the 90s, and have to chase Loki using a jet ski, like some deranged version of Speed 2. With the upcoming Eternals movie and Spider-Man 3, we don't think Loki will play into Spider-Man 3. We think it will have some effect on the film, but rather, we think we won't see the end result until the Ant-Man sequel. Something about when Hunter C-20 says she told him where to find the timekeepers makes us think that they are most likely living inside the quantum realm itself. I want to go home. I'm going to get you there. Just call the TVA. Let the infirmary know we're no, going to bring No, no, no. I gave it away. I gave it away. What did you give away? The timekeepers, where they are. I, I gave it away how to find them. Not to mention that the official statement of Marvel is that Loki has nothing to do with Spider-Man 3. But when asked about Doctor Strange 2 or the Ant-Man sequel, they suddenly went silent. Yes, Spider-Man 3 leads into Doctor Strange 2. It seems like several films will lead into it, instead of an Avengers film. Doctor Strange will be the major event holder in the current phase with only four more episodes to go, and then the release of Black Widow film coming in July, it's finally good to see the MCU rolling out again. Here's to hoping we see some grander events of cosmic proportions unfold, rather than the by-the-numbers villain just trying to rule with power. I want to thank you all for checking out our video. We'll have another hot update for you all next Wednesday when episode 3 airs. Feel free to leave a comment down below of your own theories or expanding on some of ours. I think that's one of the best things about the MCU, all the theorizing. If you liked the video, make sure to subscribe and like it as well. Don't forget to share it with your friends and zap that bell icon to stay up to date with all of our newest releases via notifications. I've been your host, Jackie K for Fat Ninja Studios. And before I go, I have a question. What would you do if you found out that you were destined to make someone else greater? That your only purpose in life was to make someone else a hero? Leave your response in the comments below or join our Discord link in the description below. And remember, no matter what the TVA says, you do have a choice. What you say and what you do matters. So, be good people.
Take care.